I am terrified of bats. Bats are one of my greatest fears, and uh, for a couple summers while I was in college, I was serving as a cap- campground chaplain in a town called Tynesta in western Pennsylvania. In my first summer doing this, I lived in this large house all by myself. And I was up late one night reading the Lord of the Rings. Do we have any Lord of the Ring fans here? Yes, you know who you are. All right, woohoo, good. I'm not alone. And so I'm up late reading the Lord of the Rings, and then all of a sudden, I hear a thud on the bedroom door. And I panicked. I didn't know who or what was on the other side of that door. And so thankfully, I finally mustered up enough courage to open the door only to find a bat circling the hallway. So I was terrified. I didn't know what to do. And so as a young college student, what do you sometimes do when you don't know what to do? You call your parents, right? Okay, so... I called my parents and they gave me some good advice on how to safely get the bat out of the house, which I was eventually able to do. But I remember right before I got off the phone with my parents, my mom said these words to me. She said, Hannah, if you could just be brave enough, if you could just be brave enough, I believe you can get the bat out of the house. Do you know how hard it is to just be brave enough when you're facing one of your greatest fears? If you could just be brave enough, you and I know what it's like to just be brave enough to live in this anxious world all around us. We live in such an age of anxiety where we are fearful and worried about many things. There's so much unknown and so much uncertainty all around us. We are afraid about the threat of nuclear war. We are concerned about inflation and rising food and gas prices. We're worried about if we've saved enough for retirement or our child's college education. We're worried about climate change or losing loved ones. There are so many things we are afraid of. And in fact, if you were here over the last couple services during Holy Week, I asked you to write down some of your fears. And so we have them up here displayed for you today that we are afraid of not being good parents. We're afraid of death, of anger, of pain. We are afraid of not being enough, of unmet expectations. There are so many things we are afraid of. In fact, fear is kind of like a fog that is everywhere and yet nowhere at the same time. And we live in such an anxious age that it's almost like we carry around this fog that lingers even in the back of our minds, even in the most joyous times of our life. And we want to be set free from this suffocating fog in our life, but we don't know what to do. And the good news in the midst of our fear, if there is any good news, is that we are all in this together, right? We're all in this foggy, fearful, anxious age together. And the good news, too, is that, believe it or not, that first Easter morning was saturated with fear. When I reread the passage out of Matthew 28 in preparation for today, I realized fear was popping up all over the place that first Easter morning. And so I believe this passage has the power to help set us free this morning. So let's take a look at Matthew 28, beginning in verse 1. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. These two Marys had been brave enough to follow Jesus. They had been brave enough to stand at the foot of the cross when Jesus was crucified, when so many other of the disciples had deserted Jesus. They were brave enough to see where Jesus's body had been placed in the tomb, and they were brave enough to show up to the tomb that first Easter morning. And this is what they saw. And suddenly there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. 
I know you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has been raised as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead and indeed is going ahead of them to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. The two Marys were brave enough to show up at the tomb on that first Easter morning and they witnessed a terrifying series of events. There was an earthquake and an angel descending from heaven that was as bright as lightning. It was so terrifying that the two guards stationed at the tomb passed out like dead men. And somehow the two Marys were able to be brave enough to witness this scene and the angel tells them that famous biblical phrase, do not be afraid that Jesus has come back to life. Jesus hasn't been resuscitated. This isn't some ER episode where Jesus is clear back to life and then will die again. No, Jesus has been resurrected, which means he will never face death again, that Jesus has defeated the power of sin and death. This is what the women are experiencing on Easter morning. And if that wasn't enough, the story continues in verse eight. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell Jesus' disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came to Jesus, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee There they will see me. Those two women were rewarded by showing up at the empty tomb by being the first people to lay their eyes on the risen Christ. That they became the first preachers, the first proclaimers of the Easter message that Christ is risen, that they had seen the Lord. And the only reason we gather on Easter to celebrate this story is because those two women were brave enough to go and tell the disciples who told the world about the good news of Jesus Christ. And there is so much going on in this passage, but I want us to look at verse 8 just one more time. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy. That fear and joy are not mutually exclusive. In fact, I believe if you dig deep enough beneath your fears, you will discover joy. You will discover what you care about, what you cherish, what you love. I'll give you an example. Some of you know I'm a parent of a new one-year-old. And uh, as a new parent, I share a fear that perhaps many other parents have where I have this fear that I'm somehow gonna mess up the life of my young daughter and then she's gonna have to spend years in therapy just to deal with living with me for 18 years, right? Can I get an amen? Some of you parents know where I'm at, okay? So I'm afraid of this, but I realize I have the choice to live my life being anxious and afraid about messing up my daughter's life or I could dig deep beneath that fear and ask myself, well, what do I care about? What do I treasure? What do I value? And when I realize is what I care about is the life of my daughter, that I love her and I want what's best for her. I want her to flourish in the world, to be all that she was created to be. And I have a choice. I can focus on my fear or I can focus on my love for her. And I believe when we focus on the love that's beneath our fears, it has the power to set us free. First John says, perfect love cast out fear. That actually courage is not the opposite of fear. Love is the opposite of fear and it has the power to set us free. Because I believe we are called to live fearlessly. I'm going to share a confession with you. I'm a This Is Us fan. Do we got any This Is Us fans in the house or online? Yes, all right. Following along with the show, This Is Us. And I'm watching this uh, current season. And there's been this iconic episode where they keep flashing back to one particular scene throughout the season that we're in currently. And what's going on in that episode is the matriarch of the family, Rebecca Pearson, has been diagnosed with the early stages of Alzheimer's. 
And she's together with her three children after they've celebrated Thanksgiving together. And while she still has all of her faculties, she has a message for each of her three children. So she sits them down and looks them in the eyes and said, you will not make your life smaller because of me. This thing, this illness that is happening to me will not be the thing that holds you back. So take the risk, make the big moves, even if they're small moves. Forge ahead with your lives in any direction that moves you. I am your mother and I am sick, but I am asking you to be fearless. Church, I believe that God is asking us to be fearless that the power of God's love sets us free from our fears, that God wants to set us free to live fearlessly. But how, how do we do this? Well, I think it starts with doing this work that we've been doing over the last couple days or even right now in this moment of answering the question of what are you afraid of? How would you answer that question? What are you afraid of? And being honest about your fears. Maybe you are afraid of losing your family or you are afraid of letting other people down or you're afraid of sadness or not accepting change. What are you afraid of? And then I think we have to be willing to dig beneath our fears to ask that second question, which is what do you love? Maybe you fear getting sick, and when you dig beneath that sick, you find out what you cherish, what you value is health and self-care. Or maybe you're afraid of losing a loved one and you dig beneath that fear and you realize what you love is that relationship and time with them that you can't imagine life without them. And so we have to be willing to do this deep work of digging beneath our fears to discover what we love. And then once you've done that, the last step is to trust in the reality of God's love. You see, love is the reality of all creation. Love is who God is and what God looks like. Love is what led to the creation of the universe that God creates out of love. Love is what gave us all a choice to either love God or reject God. That love requires a choice. Love is what set God on a rescue mission to restore us and all of humanity to put back together the broken pieces of our lives. Love is what led Jesus to the cross. Love is what led those women to the tomb to discover it was empty. That love is the strongest power in the universe. That love has the power to set us free. That love brought Jesus back to life and that love offers you and I new life every single day. That love has the power to set us free. Romans 8.38 says it so well, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Love is the reality of all creation and love has the power to set you free. Now I'm gonna be honest with you, church, that danger still exists in the world. It's still gonna be an anxious and scary place out there. It is scary to be a human. But we have a choice to make that we can choose to live our lives looking through a lens of fear or we can choose to look through a lens of love. One of the most powerful things about human psychology is the ability to choose, to choose one thought over the other. And we by ourselves may feel powerless, which is why we desperately need the power of God in our lives to set us free. 
So I believe that God wants to set all of us free this morning in this moment. And I don't want you to miss this opportunity. So as the worship team comes to lead us in some more songs, you received a sticky note on your way in today. And so I invite you to take out that sticky note. And I invite you to spend time during this next song in prayer responding to God's love in your life. Maybe you take some time reflecting on what are you afraid of? What are some of your deepest fears? And then to move beneath that, to ask that second question of what do you love? And then to be so bold, to be brave enough to trust in the reality of God's love. I'm gonna invite you to do this as a response today. And then whenever you feel so led, I invite you to stand up and place your sticky note, your prayer on the walls of the sanctuary. You'll see the sticky notes up from the 830 service. And this is creating a beautiful picture, an image of the current or the river of God's love that is all around us, that it's in you and it's in me, and that it ripples out from this sanctuary into the world that we get to take God's love with us to live fearlessly and to change the world around us. So don't miss this moment, but take an opportunity to surrender to the power of God's love that wants to set you free.